you're very welcome to Paper Chooses. And this is um, a very special uh, episode we have in store for you today. We we're going to chat with the uh, export sports psychologist and uh, a well-rounded psychologist in the field of mental health and uh, an optimal performance. It's uh, Dr. Neve Fitzpatrick. Neve, how are you keeping? I'm well, thank you. Good, you? good. Um, Neve, we've we've been doing a different approach on Paper Chooses lately, where we've been looking at a subject and we've been diving deep into it. And your expertise or mastermind subject probably would be um, sports psychology. And uh, I just wanted to start with actually, you gave a great quote recently. Sport is not just a sport; it's so much more than that. And it made me wonder: well, it's sports psychology. It's not just sports psychology. Is there so much more than that, Neve? What do you think? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, sports psychology, I suppose, for me, I would see the person, you know, when you come to the sports field, you come as a person first, and then you're the athlete. So sports psychology has to be about so much more than just you, the athlete, you, the player, you, the swimmer, you know, you, the rider, you're so much more than that. So the psychology of sport needs to allow for that, needs to address that, needs to embrace that, needs to bring that into it. So I think if we think of sports psychology and we only think of the performance, the the delivering, you know, the winning, if you like, even the bouncing back, we're only looking at one element of you as a person. We're not looking at enough because you as an individual has got to be taken into account and that means much more than what you do on that sports field it means what your life is like it means what your you know stresses are your worries are your concerns are your demands are it means paying attention to all of those things not just can you execute that particular skill or talent you have in your sport under pressure when it matters does that make sense it does, Neve, And you've gathered, I'd say, over the years through your work with Wexford back in 96 and the Olympics. Uh, 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 I don't know if system would be the right way, but I'm sure a format like in that you have your briefing with your players, then you sit down with them one to one and you get a sense of where they're all coming from and you bring it back together in such a unique way. Would that be fair to say? Well, it'd be fair to say you've done your homework, haven't you? <laughs> um, yeah, I when I started first, it the work was very much in the, the way we were trained was very much around that dealing with the person as the performer and maybe dealing with the team was around, you know, dealing with them as a unit. But I found as I began to work that really that just wasn't working for me because they're not a unit. They're there are individual people who have each their own talent within this sport and they're working together towards a common goal, but they're very different. Their outside lives might be different. Their sporting lives might be different. So I began to learn very early on, really early on actually with Wexford that I needed when I was working with a team to work with them as individuals first and to look at each person on their own and to see how could we get that person, whether it's a player, whether it's a manager as well, because I would work very closely with coaches or managers um, and it's to see how can we get optimum from everybody and then collectively, of course, you're putting that together for the team effort, for the group effort. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel really strongly about that and I probably moved away from what I would have seen when I was doing some of my training, which might be more that sense of that you're dealing with people in collectives. There was maybe more talk of team talks or, you know, less talk of the individual work. Um, yeah. I think Neve, the quality that you bring, that's your, your most um, illustrious anyway, or illustrious might not be the right word, but what the, the quality that you bring is probably your intuitive energy and your receptiveness uh, to a team environment um, you, I, I could even tell that uh, like I listened to your, the Hurling podcast and I really recommend anyone that's tuned in to listen to the Hurling podcast because you go you take a deep dive back into your memory try, drawers for those special days going down the N11 you can really picture it um, you're, you're fresh from college and off you go and Liam Griffin takes you under your wing as well I don't think that's right to say, but uh, Liam Griffin and you have a great bond and uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it just comes to life. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a feel. I, I, I think sports psychology, I think psychology is a science, but I think it's an art. I think there's a feel to it. I think, oh, how shall I put this? I think you have to have, so you look what I'm doing. I don't know if you can see now. But I, so my hands, I put my hands to my heart, to my chest. You know, we, we need to understand and know the research and the best practice and the strategies and and all of that. Oh, that's all so important. But we also need to know that we're dealing with human beings and there's about a reading, there's about a rapport, there's about a building connections and um, understanding, listening. There's also that sort of I want to do this. It's like this X factor piece involved in that. And I think that's the piece you're talking about, about the intuitive. You just sometimes need to know. You need to know how to read the person, how to read the group, how to read the team, the squad the mood and to be able to sense and sometimes you can't put your hand on it, your finger on it, say maybe from a more academic perspective or more theoretical perspective. Sometimes you can't. You just know I see all these people. I hear all these people. I know what task is ahead of us now in this competition and you just know what's needed. Is it is it you know, sometimes is it a gentleness? Is it a straightness? Is it more information? Is it taking the foot off the pedal? Is it bringing certain aspects of the team, the squad together and getting them to do a bit more extra work? And you, there's a, there is an intuition. It's you, you, you're so right in that word. I hadn't even really thought of that myself, but you're so right. There's an intuition around it. Um, and an intuitive sense of what's needed. And I um, certainly that was, I would never have been part of my training or never even discussed as part of the training. But after 30 years in psychology, I do think it's a part of it. And I think there's an art, a little bit of art, as well as the science of psychology. If, if that makes, if that it makes sense, leave. it, it sounds a little soft, but I don't mean it to sound as soft as it maybe it's coming across <laughs> we can make it less up as we go but i have to say when you look at sports psychology and when you look at your recent uh, on your work on grief and the book you know and your message on feel the feeling th this is this is how mental health is shifting a little when we look at like maybe um you know your man messel van der volk uh you know the, the body yeah uh, keeps, the, body the, keeps score. the score yeah and you when you look at um it basically that w this is that there's real in, in in accessing the feeling that is the first place to go to when it comes to mental health and psychology. Yeah, it's about for me, it's about, you know, wherever you are in your life, it's about understanding your emotional world. So I do some work, as you said earlier, on mental health. So that might be around anxiety, depression, grief, stress. And then I do some work in the performance psychology space. And even within that, there will be some work on the mental health space with you know, working with the athlete population. And in either instance, doesn't matter what the issue is, whether it's a performance issue or it's a mental health issue. For me, a starting point is for somebody to understand their feelings, to understand what is going on in their body and what's going on in their mind, in their cognition, you know, what's going on in their behavior to under to really understand that emotional world um, and to notice their feelings and to be able to observe their feelings and to be able to understand their feelings and accept them. You know, so often we judge our feelings. I, you know, I'm really nervous about that competition. What's wrong with me? Or now I hear so often you know, in the last two years, I'm, I'm so anxious. What's wrong with me? Nothing. We're living in a pandemic, you know? So there's pieces around that, around understanding what you're feeling, but also accepting those feelings and realizing that you're not stupid or you're not not coping or you're not weak. You're a human being who's usually having what I find is a normal, understandable, emotional response to whatever life is throwing at you. Sometimes what we need and what I would do as a psychologist is to try and help somebody understand maybe 
where their own role is in that in terms of their thinking. So what are their expectations? Let's take the sport example for a minute. You know, you might be feeling anxious about something, but what's your expectations for yourself on that competitive field? What do you allow yourself? You know, do you allow yourself to make mistakes? Do you expect yourself to never make a mistake? Do you allow yourself to be human? Um, or do you expect yourself to be almost machine like? So I might help somebody understand where some of their thinking processes are rigid, are unrealistic, are extra demanding, too demanding. And therefore, that's bringing in that sense of the anxiety piece. Um, and, and sometimes also it's helping somebody understand that anxiety is a normal response. It's a natural response. It's something we don't want to get rid of from us, mm. from our systems. Yeah. But it's but it's maybe how if you're a performer, can you manage your cognitive world, your emotional world, so as to be able to find yourself in the ideal performance state to to play? Mm. What you described there is, and we were talking just before coming on air about how, um, you know, sports psychology is coming back into, well, it's taken on a new form in the limelight when we look at um, the past year and like famous examples of like Simone Biles and, and top class performers taking a step back for their own personal uh, to gather themselves um, and withdrawing from competitions. Has this, has it put the lens back on uh, the focus back on uh, your profession? Well, what I find interesting is if I think of, say, an awful lot of things I'm asked to do recently around talks now with um, clubs, they might come to me and ask me to talk about minding your mental health. Can you talk to our players or can you talk to our coaches around minding their mental health and understanding their mental health? And I think that piece around understanding that you are a person first and then you are a player is key. It's key to understanding anything um, when it comes to sports performance, but also anything when it comes to just understanding yourself as a person. You know, there will come a day for any athlete when they won't be a player. They might be a supporter. They might have nothing to do with support. They might move go into coaching, but th there is a shelf life in, in mm. many sports or some sports. If you take something like you might take something like you know, maybe golf or question sports, you might see people in those sports who are older than some other sports where there will be a shorter shelf life. But at some point there is a shelf life in 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 all sport. And it's really about understanding that sport is a part of your life and a huge part of your life, maybe for some people, but it is a part of your life. So what about the other parts of your life? What about your relationships? What about your sleep? What about your you know, connections with life outside of that sporting arena, the pieces of joy that you can get from other elements of life. What about your dreams for yourself in life? You know, what about your finances? What all of those things matter in terms of our wellness. And I just think it's really important and it's something as a trend in sports psychology that we're noticing really is that piece about looking at the person wider than the athlete so as a complete individual and paying attention to that mental health piece it's so important i'm really glad to see it i probably came into sports psych i have a degree in psychology a master's in clinical psych and a master's majoring in sports psych so probably because of the clinical psych work maybe you know i probably do more counseling psychology than clinical psychology but because of those bits around anxiety and depression and stress and grief i'm really aware if i'm dealing with a footballer i'm dealing with the person first and so i think it's great to see this awareness now and it's great to see more conversations around it and people understanding that you know somebody yes of course makes the choice to put themselves out there on the field and out there in the world um for comment on and critique of when they go into the sporting arena and they know that's part of it but it's just also remembering that's a person that's somebody's daughter or son that's somebody's mother you know that's somebody's sister and so this idea really that they're machines which i think sometimes can be 
thought of really we forget that there's people I for me I'm, I'm really glad to see the mental health conversation coming into the sports performance conversation do you think that's softening how like our impressions of sport at all because I think that sport is being taken a little bit more seriously nowadays it seems that way anyway club teams are a lot more professional um, mm. uh, do you know I think everything's taken a lot more seriously now and I I don't know that that's a good thing. I, you know, I yeah. obviously progress is wonderful. Um, you know, when you look at what people are able to do now in the performance world and you compare that to years ago. So you take some athletes who would have been, you know, top of the game, medal winning athletes years ago, and you look at what athletes now can do. There's huge differences, obviously, in that evolution in, in that space as we move and we push and we develop that, that's all great there's there's wonderful stuff in there but there's something in it about that i think there's a general gist with us in life that we're taking everything too seriously i sort of feel a bit that we uh, we need to take that foot off the gas sometimes and we need to come back to basics and remember that we're human beings trying our best. We're having an endeavor to see, you know, this is what I can do in this sport. Let me test it and let me see how far I can go. Let me see what I can do. But whether it's supporters, whether it's critics, you know, whether it's people sort of, you know, writing on the sport, there's such seriousness about it as if athletes went out with the you know, maybe with the not with the intention to not do well, but certainly maybe there's sometimes an implication there that athletes go out and they didn't try hard enough or they don't work hard enough. Oh, my gosh. Yes, they do. They do. And and so I just think sometimes we could we could tweak that bit about how seriously we take things and and, and we could do with stepping back and realizing that is a person who's done their absolute best that day. And if their best wasn't good enough, then their best wasn't good enough. There is no one greater than them for, you know, stopping and having a look at that and being unhappy with that and wanting to learn from that. And so this taking things so seriously to the point where we really get after people um, and, and criticize them maybe as people in their characters uh, for what they do in the sports field, that anything around that kind of area, I'm just, I'm not a fan of, I think, life is too short and I think we just sometimes need to step back from that kind of thing a little bit it's a really important message if I haven't I wasn't expecting that sort of an answer um I wasn't just, either to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> where did it come from I don't know <laughs> me we've so far we've it's, it's been you've covered really we get a sense of the softening presence but I want to make sure that a paper chooses as a listener knows that when you came in in 96 you came in with an expert viewpoint and uh, like there are techniques that you applied back then that have only became popular now like when we think of manifestation I remember we had Billy Byrne and Jer Kush on our live podcast um lovely men in in December lovely men yeah <laughs> Well, they describe you as a lovely lady. And, uh, you know, they were saying they beamed about the traffic light system and they beamed about, um, well, Billy in the past has told me about how you'd st he stick up little reminders of where they want to be. Um, mm -hmm. Visualization. Like, Neve, it's just when you hear these stories, it's like, how was someone so far ahead of their time? And how were these men so fortunate to benefit from someone's wisdom? You know, um, can you, what did you pick up bits and pieces from here and there? How would you describe your process? So I'm smiling because I, I smile when I think of the men of Wexford in 1996, the, the hurling team that was just such a privilege to be part of that. It was, it was incredible. And there were times along that journey where, although it sounds odd to say afterwards, we knew there was something special that we were doing. We really didn't know what that was going to be, but you had this sense of being part of something very special. So that's why it makes me smile when you even mention their names and I think of them there. Um, and I suppose for me, the bit about somebody so ahead of their time, I don't see it as that in any way, shape or form. I would have you know, picked up bits and pieces ar around my psychology training, 
bits and pieces in my sports psych training. Um, I had done a mentorship underneath a psychologist, a sports psych in London um, for almost a year, and he was involved with some of the British Olympic teams. So I got a really good grounding. And so it feels to me as if it was bits and pieces taken from some of that, but 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 it was the coming together in the moment with the Wexford team. It's that bit that you mentioned earlier about the intuitive piece. It's coming together with the Wexford team, looking at the team, looking at them individually, assessing where the gaps are, understanding that what we needed was maybe to get some messages in across to them to get some things where we were going to change some of their cognitive habits because we, we tell ourselves a story with everything in life so i'm good enough i'm not good enough i'm afraid i'm going to let people down i'm you know i'm I, i'm worried i'm not able i can't all these kind of stories we tell ourselves and what we really knew that we needed to do was we needed to change the story in many ways that a lot of players were telling themselves. And how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to do that with repetition. So if you think about it, if you think of a song, you know, that you and I might hear now, uh, it could be a song that comes on the radio and you and I would both find ourselves knowing the words to that song. Well, it's highly unlikely that either of us, well, me anyway, because I can't sing and I love music, but I don't do this, but it's highly likely that either of us would have sat down with the sheet music and with the words and learned that song. But how would we know the words of that song? Because we have heard it again and again and again on the radio, on our Spotify, on wherever we get our music. And so that repetition piece, I suppose, taking all I had learned in the psychology space and the sports psychology space and then going into the Wexford squad and understanding we needed to get some strong messaging in there with them that was going to help them shift and change the narrative of what they were doing in their heads and change the story that they were telling themselves in their minds and to have it essentially a more useful story. So part of that was breaking down their job on the field and some of the key things that we want them to do, breaking them down into small, short keywords. And, you know, we would talk about exactly what you said, the messages, where could they put these words? What would they do? And players are so inventive, you know, they put them on post-it notes and some of them would put them on not necessarily the Wexford players, but over time I've seen athletes put them on, you know, their 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 box of porridge in the morning. So they open up the press and see the box of porridge and there's, you know, the word hassle or drive or next ball or or take a breath or whatever the thing is, is is there and they see it there all that time. Um, and so that's where that came from. So I don't see it as somebody ahead of their time. I see it as maybe somebody picking up somebody me I'm picking up a couple of pieces of the jigsaw puzzle as I go along in my training. And then when I come into this Wexford setup, which was my first team job, which now 30 years into psychology seems ridiculous to me that I <laughs> took as my first job a county team. I, I really don't know what I was thinking. Uh, it was me coming into that arena and with the practical challenges that were in front of me, I was just able to then pull and draw on some of those things I had learned and really tweak some of them to come up in my own way. So the traffic light system, that just struck me, that was from something players would say, would talk about, you know, how do we focus? How do we keep our mind focused all the time on the morning of a game, leading up to the game, the night before a game, the week of a game? And I was saying, you don't. I don't want you on green all the time. I don't want your head, your focus, your energies completely on your game. And I knew that was because they would burn out by the time throw in came. So what we needed to have instead was some sort of representation for them that the focus of attention was going to be something that they would switch in of and switch out of as appropriate. 
And it just seemed to me to be to be obvious to think about a traffic light system. When you're at a traffic light, it's on red, you're stop, and green, you're go, and and an amber or orange is get ready to stop. Or if you're in the UK, get ready to go as well. So when we introduce this idea, they could get that concept that there are times when I don't need to be thinking about my game and that next ball. I can be thinking about whatever I like. But then maybe coming to training, I need to be thinking about being on amber, that I'm getting ready to train. So I'm moving from that day of study or that day of work and getting my mind and my body ready to think like a hurler again. And then when I'm on green, that might be in Croke Park on All-Ireland Final Day when, you know, the, the, the parade has been done and the anthem has been done and the huddles being done and we're getting ready for that starting whistle then we're on green and that as a concept just helps them understand the psychology of attention and a focus in sport and that's quite simply where that came from mm. it's just it, it's it's refreshing to hear it because like uh, 25 years on i mean um there was a piece in the guardian there a few months ago and it was about saying you know the sports psychology's role is to break goals down affirmations visualize success relax gather oneself they are all things that you did but you know nothing the, the the recipe hasn't changed uh but there's still a need for the recipe <laughs> yeah very much so and i suppose you know it, it, it's about for me it's about that overall understanding of what's involved in sports performance, but that in its own is not enough. It's about the ability to turn that, that into something that is going to make sense to the player. Because once the player understands it and understands what they need to do with their own emotional world, with their own cognitive world, when they understand that, then they have the ability to apply that information to their game so that they can get the best out of themselves. So. You know, for me, I feel like a facilitator that the information is there, the understanding is there about human beings and how we work and how, you know, you mentioned there about relaxing, you know, we need to be able to compose for sports performance. And, you know, so it's understanding how as a player do I do that? How do I have my body so that it is settled, it's composed rather than being you know, overactivated or over aroused? How do I do that? How do I settle and clear my mind so that I can have clarity of thought rather than feeling rushed and rather than feeling hurried and distressed and trying to get rid of the ball? So I just see myself really probably as the facilitator between that information and the player and helping each player, I'm saying player because we're talking about hurlers here in this particular instance, but any athlete, helping that player understand how to take this information about human beings and how we work and how to apply that to themselves. And part of that work sometimes, as I said, is about the performance field. But part of that work with a player might be them understanding or saying or reporting to me that they, you know, they're distracted, they're not really feeling quite right. Um, you know, they're not looking forward to play. They wish they weren't playing. There can, things like that come up. And when we, that's where the mental health piece comes in. Because when we look behind it, sometimes there's worries in their world. There's issues in a relationship. They're having a problem with a the boss. They're under financial strain. And so sometimes the work is facilitating that piece and helping them understand how to identify what they need in their personal life in order to be okay for them and their sporting life so really a facilitator is probably what i see myself as as most yeah it's a good word to describe it um but there's so it's such a, you you've mentioned before how you want to always work with teams and i could see well i suppose yeah i can see why there's such a graph for uh, like when uh, there's such a science behind it as well when like in that same article there was um stats on uh, penalty conversions and um the, the the chances of someone if if they if they have to score the next one for to to the score penalty to to win the game it's 92% conversion but mm -hmm. if the if defeat is hanging in the balance and if they 
if oh one second if loss is the result of missing it uh, players are the chance of scoring at are sixty two percent. So such a gulf in such a thing that we take as just simple probability. But um, but there's so many layers to that. So so and just as a, a a very gentle tweak of what you said there, it's not that I always want to work with teams. Is that I only want to work with teams. I love working with individual athletes or even also individual clients who are nothing to do with sports. So just to clarify that what it is is that i love to work with teams because of that piece around the complexity of it there's so many layers to that if you're an athlete in your own sport and you have a shot to make a you know some sort of um some sort of um an an endeavor to to do in your own sport you have you yourself resting on your shoulders when you're in a team sport on the one hand there's shared responsibility and that can you know we can often find say anxiety levels are lower in team sports because it, we share it we share the defeat and we share the success along the way but at the same point when you're in the team sport there can be a greater sense then of anxiety sometimes with people because it's I don't want to let my teammates down. They're over there watching me about to take this kick. I don't want to let them down because there's a camaraderie with us. There's a sense of unity. I know how hard they've all worked. And I love that complexity of it, that it's just not as straightforward or simple. Um, it's the dynamics between people, it's the connections, it's all the different characters, it's the egos, it's the agendas, it's balancing all of that to try and help all of these people come together and as one find their best on an individual level but also on a team level. It's just, as a psychologist, it's an immense challenge. And I think that's probably why I love it, because it takes me to the edge of my work and it pushes me. And I it's quite scary. It's a huge responsibility. You know, if I think of going to work with the GAA team, for example, so you might have a squad of 35 players. You could have you know, a manager. As I said, I'd always work closely with the manager. You might have a backroom team of you know, 15, maybe more. You have selectors. There's a huge crew there and you can be pulled and drawn into every aspect of that crew. So the responsibility there is immense. You know, I, I remember I remember getting some stick for I was at with one squad at Croke Park and I was in the um, stands with the, 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 the subs and the backroom team and coming out of the um, dressing room, I don't know why I'm telling this, but anyway, I've started so I'm going to keep going. Um, coming out of the dressing room, I had probably, things are busy in the dressing room, but me being me, um, I would probably grabbed my lipstick, I'd my lip gloss, whatever, chucked it on my lips or whatever and stuff, just because just because I did, and um, went out onto the field and somebody took a photo I don't know who it was anyway. Somebody took a photo and it came to my attention anyway that were people sort of making comments about, oh, she looks really cross, or you know, she should do this with her makeup or this, that, and the other. I just laughed. I thought, I'm responsible for 35 players, a backroom team, and um, anybody else who's there and helping each of them in whatever way they need me to help them. And that's my responsibility. And <laughs> you're concerned because you don't like the color of my lipstick or whatever the thing is. So, you know, it makes me laugh. It's it's a funny thing. It's a huge responsibility. And I love that responsibility. But uh, as that lighter side of things, you know, people don't really realize that responsibility. They look at you and they maybe see something else. Um, Anyway, as I said, not really quite sure what I, why I mentioned that, but something you said sparked that off in my head. So, Well, as to the role of this facility, we're really building up an idea of what your work has been like over, over the years and what it's still like today. Um, but like I, when you say there at the end that people might not know the, the depth of responsibility, I think the, the height of the esteem that you're held in and the height of the esteem that I'm sure you know her name, I'm for, sorry now, the Limerick um, Psychology is it Caroline Karen or Courage? 
Carolyn Curd, you know, you could, the players beamed about her, her and the speech and everything. And you could tell that this is an important position that teams need. And there are great psychologists um, around, you know, Kira Losty, Dr. Kira Losty is fantastic, Dr. Kate Kirby. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of people doing some really great work in this field, full of integrity, working hard, love the work they do, really athlete centered. Um, there's a lot of great work done. So I suppose for me, it's something I'm I'm proud of. I think the thing there with it is, I'm not so sure still how much it's understood. You know, when I started with Wexford first, really back in 1996, there wasn't a huge amount that was done previously in Ireland, certainly not in GEA circle. So the idea of a psychologist with a GA team, you know, wasn't widespread and there was a bit of uncertainty around it. So certainly at the time with Wexford, we it was nobody's business anyway, but we didn't really tell anybody who I was or what I was doing. And I was probably largely seen as the physio with the squad and stuff, and that was OK. But I think it can be misunderstood around, you know, what is it you do? do you know, do you do you do any do you do you do any weird stuff with them or do you do you, do you get them to do crazy stuff? And, and, and it's helping people, people realize it's there's nothing mystical about it. There's nothing strange about it. There's nothing weird about it. It's helping players understand their emotional world, helping players or athletes understand their cognitive world and helping them learn to balance those to the point where on the day when they need it, they can access that training that they've done and extract out their optimum performance as consistently as possible. And that's about strategies. It's about understandings. It's about reflections. It's about observations and getting them to do all of those things and learning about themselves. It's not weird stuff, but there's something about the psychology word that kind of puts people a little bit unsure of it and and maybe it is a throwback to thinking that a psychologist goes in and does some sort of brave heart type speech and rouses the troops you know and oh my goodness it's so much it's so much more than anything like that um could be so. that but it could be deeper than that it could be just our, our general sense of oh it's that's to do with the head and all oh, jane you know i don't want to go there you know like <laughs> Yes. Uh, oh, and I think that's a really important point, because I think what you've hit on there is that point around it's the head. So it's the psych part. So when we think of psych, we might think we think psychologist, we think psychiatrist. And if we look at the model, you know, if we look at the model of psychology, for example, psychology for so long was around looking at in some instances, looking at where things were not going okay for people so you know maybe clinical issues or um problems in people's life and then really i suppose positive psychology has come into the mix and that's around looking at where people thrive and where people succeed and where people grow and where people develop and so it's understanding that just because there's a psychologist in the mix it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It doesn't mean there are, you know, problems there that need to be fixed. <laughs> it's not about that. It's about understanding that whatever your sport, you have a talent in your sport. And in order to deliver that talent on the day of competition, there are some factors involved. So you have the physical factor of your fitness. You have the technical abilities in your sport. You have the tactics in your sport. You have the wider sort of lifestyle piece around managing your life and your sleep and all of that stuff. And you also have the piece of on the day of competition, when there is a clock or there is an audience or there is one shot and one chance. Can I do that under pressure? Can I deliver that shot? Can I deliver whatever it is that I need? under pressure with 82,000 people looking at me. That's the psychology piece. But when we ask athletes about what they will tend to spend in terms of a ratio in their training, their attention on, it will be the tactics. 
it will be the physical fitness it might even be the sleep and the you know the managing and juggling of the work and all of those the study and all of those kind of things but unless they're going to spend the time on putting some attention specific attention on composing themselves training themselves to compose training the mind to come back from distractions and come into the present learning how to bounce back from errors building confidence working as a unit unless you're going to 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 prep for those then you're approaching your competition not having spent time on one of the key factors in your performance and there's a psychologist a sports psychologist called dr terry orlick who says that an athlete hoping to distinguish themselves in competition without first having systematically mentally trained is like hoping god will come down at half time and turn the game around and then another psychologist said but what if god's at another game you know so you can't leave it to chance you have to understand that the the mind the emotions are part of the equation of performance and if you're going to pay attention to the others you need to pay attention to those or you are hoping you are leaving to chance and hoping that god will come down at halftime and turn the game around you bring in halftime and i'm actually reading at the moment um the high performance book have you come across that yet uh Not jay yet, humphrey but, no i'm going to check that out now show us that oh yeah um, it's from the high performance podcast it's from um Brilliant. They're, yeah, they're two great uh, presenters, Jake Humphrey and Damien Hughes. But to give an example of halftime in the England-Scotland um, rugby match, I'm not sure if you were heard, Scotland were down and they were deflated in the dressing room and yeah. the managers took a moment and instead of coming back and saying, why weren't they, you know, sticking to the tactics, they came back and said, now the second half is about showing who you are and why you're together. And so in turn, I'd like to, say that like maybe it's a case then of um the psychologists at half time or in in general going having looking at the athlete their mental training and then saying and look at how great or look at how great you are but look at your strength your inner character and extracting that that's i think where that intuitive piece comes it, it's knowing what's needed and you'll see this in great coaches and great managers along the line you know really where somebody knows there are times when somebody needs a hug and what there are times when somebody needs just a little a little push a little nudge um mm. and and sometimes that refocusing that half time piece can be about refocusing and bringing back to the strengths and bringing back to what got you here what got us to this final what work was involved? What obstacles did you overcome? And how have you navigated your way here? You know, sometimes it's about that and having players in a situation where they'll, you know, remember that they didn't buy their way into this final. They worked their way into this final. How did they do that? Let's think about that. Let's revisit that. And they can go out in that second half with a renewed sense of confidence in themselves and a renewed focus on the task at hand, which really at that point is the only thing that matters is the job at hand. But sometimes people do need to be relied or reminded of their their strengths and their abilities, because as human beings, I think we're very easy to forget those very easy to forget those and and, and 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 it's about coming back to those and remembering mm. who you are as people and I smiled when you said that because I've done that with squads a bit where we've done some really cool exercises that you know I'll, I'll give them maybe a blank bit of paper and actually just put down on the top of it I am the man who or I am a man who and just leave them a blank space and ask them to finish that, to fill in that space. And what they come out with sometimes, or I am the woman who obviously, if it's a female team, what people come out with is immense because you're asking them then to go and look at themselves and see who am I? What am I going to do that day on the field? What kind of person am I? And therefore, what kind of player am I? Because one feeds into the other. So I smiled when you said that. I haven't. I'm definitely going to get that book and read that book now, um, because I, I, I'm all about that. I think that's really important to help people get in tune with realizing that 
their character is who they bring out and what they bring out onto the field. And often with our character, we're so much more than we think we are. I mean, if you think of the pandemic, if somebody had said to most people three years ago that we would be living the life that we are living now and the life that we have been living for the past you know, two years, most of us would have said, I can't do that. I won't do that. I, I never cope with that. But here we are coping. We can do so much more than we think we can. And, and often the job of the psychologist or the job of the manager or the coach is to help people understand that in sport, because sometimes we forget. You've seen both sides of it when it comes to grief um, with uh, the loss of your sister, Dara. And um, the, when, when the reason I, I go to this subject now, Neve, is because you, you've spoken so lovingly and Con, with such conviction about the character and Dara had an amazing character and um, like I, it's it's definitely brought a, a new level to your work as you admit yourself um, like when I read that quote um, I don't mean do your best like your mommy would say no I mean be your optimum be the best thing that every cell in your body can add up to and there's a balm that comes from that regardless of the result and it, that, that there's a strength and a conviction about that message that I, I like that should be on bedroom walls across the country that that message because we we lose sight of that so often that um and, and I think that's what um you want to honor um Dara every day when uh, we, through your work as well I'm sure yeah uh, for me I suppose I think grief changes you uh, I'll, I'll rephrase that. I think grief has changed me um, or maybe revealed pieces. I, do, I don't know which it is, but but grief. Grief means grief means life in many ways becomes before and after the life before Dara died and the life after Dara died and in surviving her death, which is what I am doing is surviving her death. Um, you know, we were. I, Dara died when she was 45 and I was 48 when she died almost five years ago. And I know her face like I know my face. I know her hands like I know her hands. I I'm not a I'm not a mother. I'm a guardian of a young child with my sisters, but I of Dara's young child, but I, I'm not a I'm not a mother, but I so I don't know what it's like to lose a child. But I know losing the girl who is my sister she's still my sister she's just not here but has my been my sister on this earth for 45 years i know losing her her from my life has been life changing and as i said it's been that before and that after the fact of surviving the experience of surviving her death and learning to keep living my life even though she is not here and we had no goodbyes we had no warning surviving all of that it changes you and it and it and it gets you to see different things in life and to see life from a different perspective and so that piece about not just you know that pat on your back do you know do your best just you go out there and do your best sure it'll be grand anyway it, it it's not that bit it's about it's 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 the bit about exactly that of what i said you because you're referring to the maliki clerk and in interview yeah in the Irish Times, he did an incredible job with that interview. It was one of the most incredible pieces of writing. Um, and what I meant was how grief, I think, has helped me be better in my work is it sharpens you up because you're so acutely aware of the preciousness of life. I don't know about the shortness of life. People say life is short, but, I, you know, for some people, life is not short. For some people, life is very long. But what I know is that it's precious. And what I mean by that is, you know, when I look at Dara, what happened to her, she survived this few seconds when the Coast Guard helicopter recognized that there was an obstacle there. She survived those seconds. She survived the shock of that. She survived trying to get the helicopter 
past the obstacle. She survived the crash into the water, the impact into the water. And the helicopter went to up to 40 meters down onto the seabed. And somehow after surviving all of those previous things of the shock and the trying to bring things back and the impact into the water, even after surviving that, she managed to get her seatbelt off. She managed to get herself out of the helicopter, out of the small little window, out of the helicopter. And she tried to make for the surface, perhaps up to 40 meters down. And she didn't survive. She didn't make it to the surface. But what we know about her efforts to live is that they were Herculean. You know, it was utterly incredible for somebody to survive, to, to get through all of the things she has, had done and to still make the efforts she made to get out of that helicopter, to get back to her life, to her son and to her loved ones. And for me, what that does is, you know, that says she gave everything she used every cell in her body you know she this was at night the seas were so high it was march it was cold the waters were cold she wouldn't have been able to see anything she was alone you know it, i it's really hard to think of her last moments it's also really inspirational to think of her last moments because of what she did in her efforts to survive. And I suppose I feel that it's an insult to her to not live. She would give anything. Dara Fitz would give anything to live her life. She fought so hard. And it sort of feels to me that what grief has done is helped me maybe bring those efforts that Dara has put into trying to live into my work and into my conversations with other people. So probably what happens in the sports field is that I go to that place where I'm able to talk to people about that this is not just do your best. This is take every cell in your body and it is use it, leave nothing behind, leave nothing on the field. And, and if you fail, you are not a failure. You just failed at that attempt. But the reality is, is you're still here to live another day. You're still here to try again, you know? And so there's something there. I don't, I can't really, I can't really, I can feel myself being, um, lacking maybe in eloquence in trying to explain this, but I, there's some link there between she gave every cell in her body. She left no stone unturned and life wasn't good enough to let her live even after all her efforts. But I think that for me, that translates something into when it comes to life and living, we can't just exist. We must live. And really living means pushing yourself, means getting out of your comfort zone, means now not all the time and, and certainly not necessarily in this pandemic. This is this is pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone enough as it is. But in different things in life, really living is taking life by the scruff enough of the neck and giving it everything you can. And that's probably, I would say, where grief has maybe made me feel that I found better in my work as a result of being bereaved. Again, I, no, I don't know if that if that I've makes no any doubt sense. about it. I do. I've no doubt about it. Neve. Um, I, I, I'm just struck that. Why do you think like we half an hour ago, we said that we're taking life too serious. And then you have faced something extraordinarily serious. So, so something you're you're in your family face something so so grave, so like life changing, as you say. And the other um, families, yeah. Sorry. And the other families. And the other families, it. of course, yeah. yeah, yeah, with the Black Star tragedy. Um, what what is it that about life that we can um. am I trying to go it's just there seems like there's a little dichotomy there where life is about giving everything but yet 
don't take it too serious don't take it too serious in a pandemic what do you have any thoughts on that yeah because i think that's about the framework i think that's about the context i think it's about having the wider picture of saying you know well when it comes to my overall life when i say my i'm talking about an athlete you know necessarily or or a person doesn't matter looking at when it comes to my overall life let me look at the things that matter to me in life that really matter because what grief does for example is it clarifies things it's like it's like it's like your glasses before you're bereaved Mm. if you're wearing glasses were kind of smudged and then when you're bereaved it's like they're wiped clean and you can see life with a clarity that you couldn't see before. And part of that clarity is realizing what matters in life. And so much of what we worry about, what we talk about, what I see people arguing about, is just noise. It's it's just utter noise. It's when you have without goodbyes, without warning, when you have everything taken away from you, um, and everything changed in an instant. You know, Dara was a mother of a young boy and so myself and my two sisters are guardians to him now and we raise him now. So as well as grieving my sister, I grieve the life that I would have had if I'm not partly responsible for raising a child that has changed the course and the path of of my life um, for for decades until he's until he's an adult. And so there's huge layers of grief in there with that. And so there's a clarity that comes with that about things that are important. And for me, the bit about, because I hear what you're saying, the bit about, you know, how do we not take life too seriously? And then how do we take life seriously to give it everything, to to use every cell in our body? For me, that's about stepping back and looking and saying, what are the things that matter to me in life? They're usually going to be people. They're going to be people you care about. And it's about looking to see, can I manage my life? Can I live my life so that I have those people in it, so that I nurture those connections, so that I have good relationships with those people, so that I love and am loved. If we can all do something around that, then I suppose we're doing that piece of life and putting that piece of the jigsaw puzzle in and getting the stuff that's really important the next piece then about maybe your performing life or your working life or you know some other aspect of your life it's about knowing that well i have the really important things in there which are my people my connections the the love in my life knowing that that is there and i'm safe and i'm okay And no matter what happens on this sports field, I will go home to a house where I'm loved and I love. It's knowing that, but then in this moment, acting in this moment as if it's the only thing in the world, that you give it absolutely everything you can and everything you have. And the reason you can do that is because actually you know that if we fail, we're not failures. We're still going back to those people who love us that 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 my, that in my mind is the way to balance out that seriousness kind of thing it's it's knowing we're coming from a place of safety that we have the things that really matter in life sorted if you like sorted is the wrong word but we have them addressed we're looking at the people side of life but then when it comes to the endeavor side of life empty the tank give it everything, be brave, push yourself, be courageous, do what you can, because you're liked, you're loved, you're respected by these people over here who really matter to you. And they are going to like and love and respect you, whether you kick that ball over the bar or not. And that, that that's, I don't know if that's answered that question. You, you totally clarified it. Thank you so much for, for just, um, diving in and being willing to um to 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 put words on it um and i don't have all the answers to that by the way they're, they're no i know that they're just but, my they're just my kind of thoughts on it and i and i i think if you i think if we come from the solid base of knowing that we're liked and we're loved by ourselves as well as by the people in our life that matter to us 
there's a safety in that that allows us to push ourselves in our endeavors and to say, let me really go for it. Don't hold back. Don't, you know, often we play safe in life and we think, oh, I'll just sit in this comfort zone here because what if I pop my head above the parapet and I get it wrong or I fail or I, you know, and there's something there about when we have this safety over here. I'm sort of saying to people, get this side of your life sorted. This is the real thing that matters. Even when you love your sport, you know, if you're on your deathbed, it may well be that there are some sporting moments that come into your mind, but it, it seems to be from what we're told that it's very much about the people moments that come into people's mind, you know, and so get that side of your life sorted, the things that really matter. And then from that place of safety, go after this bit and push yourself and see what you can do. That, that's that's my philosophy. The things that are eternal. Neve, um, that, that was beautiful. It's a, a conversation that will live long in my memory. And thank you so much for your generosity, your humility, your honesty, and all the many positive traits that you have. And thank you for sharing your heart and your story. And uh, just in case people are interested in learning more about you, um, I know you're on Twitter and your book as well, of course, it's still available. Yeah. Yeah, so Twitter is um, at N Fitz Psychology. And the reason I like Twitter is because and social media gets such a bad rap, I know, but I find there's a real community there, um, not only just with grief. I do a lot of work with grief on Twitter and you see people supporting one another and coming in on the replies to maybe something I might put up and they're supporting mm -hmm. one another. It's just gorgeous. So that a Twitter space I find is a good space. I'm quite lucky on that space. Um, and then my book is called Tell Me the Truth About Loss. And I just grief as a sister has been so different, is so different than grief as a psychologist than what I expected it to be. And I just wanted to write about the truth about the how bewildering it is, how confusing it is, how you know, grief is a whole body experience. It's it has it has physically changed me. It has emotionally changed me, cognitively changed me. And I just thought, well, if I find this as I grieve, Dara, then might others. And so that's why I wrote the book. And a lot of people will comment to me even on a weekly basis, because for me, the book is about it's my story of loss, grief and finding hope. And I think as a griever, you need to have hope hope that one day you learn to carry the pain of the loss of your loved one. And I have email after email and message after message of people saying, you know, um, I feel normal in my grief. I feel I understand my grief now. And so that's what I, I hope my readers will get from that book is that sense of not being alone, but being part of a community and being normal in however they feel for whomever or whatever they grieve in their life. Um, and so, yeah, if, if that book can be of any use to anybody, I'm I'm heart heart warmed by that. Neil Fitzpatrick, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for asking me.